built in. Yeah. <laughs> At least it's like only on a small wall. Like, kind of. Yeah. It's when, not. When it was called like the Orchard View Room, I was like, what? Well, or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey. What are we feeling about timeline? Do you want me to wait a little bit? Okay, so you should have our the tag. The environment. I don't think I can sign in. Yeah, yeah, so you can Sorry. sign in and make your own. I exited all the environment. Yeah. I'm coming. So you know my coding is that perfect. I. I know of her, yeah. The, the undergrad <laughs> program is kind of separate from the yeah, my guess would also graduate be program. Um, so the undergraduate program is run through LSMA, like, commissions housed by C's. Yeah, I don't know. Two minutes or So just before you start, very rarely do they ask about how she How's it going? I know you're registered. You are. Hey, folks, uh, in the in person, uh, we'll get ourselves going here. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I uh, appreciate you coming off the holidays and right back into it. So I hope we have a wonderful afternoon for you. Um, I'm Sean Scoville. I'm currently the director for the Center uh, for Ecology and Environment. We're really pleased to have our fall symposium uh, brought to you here. We've got a great panel of speakers today and tomorrow. And um, again, just uh, hope you enjoy the time. There's going to be a refreshments during and then after the uh, talks today, if you're able to stay uh, and join us for some chit chat. Um, 
What I want to do quickly is just acknowledge the contributors who are supporting the center uh, in this uh, symposium today. Um, so we're uh, technically housed in the Nelson Institute, that's our home, um, but we're uh, supported by both uh, Letters and Sciences and Ag and Life Sciences. Uh, they support us financially and have uh, been maintaining our um, programming for the last few years. Um, this uh, event has been sponsored by the University Lectures and our department co-hosts our entomology and force and wildlife ecology. So uh, to all those entities, we say thank you for bringing us uh, together today and for supporting the event. Okay. So uh, a quick overview of um, other things that are coming up for us. Um, we do things year-round, and we're looking forward to the spring semester bringing another series of events. Um, uh, this is just a ranking of them, kind of in the time period which they'll occur. So we'll have a, our graduate recruitment uh, session uh, early February. So for those of you who are bringing in students or would like to share a poster of your research or just to get together and socialize, please put that in your calendar. It's usually in the afternoons around 3 o'clock. Um, in the, uh, the main union. Um, we're going to be scheduling a faculty dinner that's sort of on the books, but we don't have a date yet, um, most likely in late February. Um, we host an undergraduate ecology job fair, uh, so students who um, may have summer jobs that you want to advertise to recruit undergrads to work on, uh, or labs that are thinking of that, um, you can start letting us know kind of as we come into January, and we'll put together a list and we'll uh, be tabling um, in Burge Hall to uh, try to recruit undergrads to our um, uh, seasonal projects. Um, and then finally, um, the grad students are organizing a spring symposium. So this is a similar event, but held in the spring and really features the excellence in our graduate student research. Um, so the dates there are May 1st and 2nd. Um, we have keynote speakers lined up and we're really looking forward to a, a nice uh, presentation then. Um, a couple of notes on things that we're working on in the background. Um, we've been trying to build out an ecology and evolutionary biology PhD program. That's still in the works. Um, we're still sorting out some details, but we're hoping that uh, gets pushed forward this year. Um, and we'll, we'll see that develop into a full-fledged program in the near future. Um, this is something that the, the Center for Ecology and Environment and the Crow Institute for the Study of Evolution are jointly sponsoring. Um, another thing is that we have a, a new entity, uh, a, um, and Ecology Society of America Seeds Program on campus. Uh, we call it Wild Seeds for our campus. Um, that's really to foster uh, diversity in ecology at the undergraduate level and uh, uh, provide programming and opportunities for those students to develop leadership skills, to go to meetings, um, just to, to bond together and talk about ecology. Um, so this is something that's uh, fledgling. Um, and if you have undergrads that you know are looking for leadership opportunities, looking for uh, other, other people to talk to, uh, for career planning purposes, for learning about REUs, all of these things, uh, please um, point them our way. Um, this is just kind of an overview of it. And we have uh, some um, ways to connect to us here if you want to take a photo. Um, and please just get the word out. We really need to sort of build up enthusiasm and get more undergrads involved. Um, and with that, I'll just end there and say thanks again for coming. And uh, I want to make a particular uh, set of thanks to uh, my executives that help run this program. Uh, so this is the name of everybody that's involved in the executive com committee right now. Um, so many thanks to their efforts throughout the year. It's a voluntary effort and, um, uh, you know, to bring all this programming together. And they really do an excellent job. In particular, uh, Wendy Turner and James Crawl have organized this fall symposium. So we have them to thank for running behind the scenes. And uh, Kyle Weber, who's done everything in, in terms of administrative uh, tasks that involved with setting this up. I want to thank the three of them for their uh, extra work. So with that, uh, welcome, and uh, I'll let uh, James come up. Great. Um, thanks again so much for everyone to be here. It's, it's uh, great to see you. For everyone online, we'll try to translate the feeling of kind of continuous low-level earthquake associated with uh, <laughs> the construction happening next door. Um, but yeah, so I'm just thrilled about the speakers that we have um, today and tomorrow at the symposium, sort of reflecting the breadth of ecological and environmental research interests here at the university. Um, and so just again, each day, so today and tomorrow, each day we'll have two speakers 
from our sort of local um, CE community, uh, talking a little bit more about work happening here, and then followed by a keynote each day by Dr. Mercedes Pascual, who's our keynote um, lecturer for this, this symposium. Um, is Sarah first? Or is Sarah? Sarah is first. That was, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. And so just a reminder, so we'll have time for questions at the end of each talk. Um, certainly we will we'll take questions from in person, but also if you're online on Zoom, uh, feel free to put your questions into the chat and we will um, monitor that and I think chat or Q&A? Well, put questions where it seems like you can put questions online if you're, if you're on Zoom and we will monitor that. Um, so with that, I'm thrilled to invite our first speaker uh, for the day, Dr. Sarah Enser. Uh, Dr. Enser is an assistant professor, professor of English and a faculty associate in the Nelson Institute for Culture, the Center for Culture, History, and the Environment. Uh, her work engages the intersections between queer and environmental thought in American literature from the 19th century through the present. Her current book project, Queer Lasting, Ecologies of Care at Future's End, asks what contemporary environmentalism's seemingly necessary emphasis on the future has rendered unthinkable, and turns to queer theory and literature to demonstrate how temporariness and apparent futurelessness can engender, rather than preclude, forms of community, persistence, and care. She's also the co-editor of the Cambridge Companion, uh, Companion to American Literature and the Environment, which was published earlier this year. Uh, and before arriving here in Madison, she was an assistant professor of English at Portland State University, and then Assistant Professor of English and Environmental Humanities at the University of Michigan. Her talk today is titled, Queer Ecologies and Other Incongruous Juxtapositions. Please join me in doc welcoming Dr. Enser. All right, <clears throat> thank you so much for having me from the other side of campus. Um, and I seem to be losing my voice, so I apologize in advance for throat clearing <clears throat> or coughing. Um, so when James and Wendy invited me to participate in this symposium, I responded that I would be honored to take part, but confessed that what I would have to say as a literary scholar and environmental humanist and queer theorist would undoubtedly sound like it was coming out of left field. And so I've come to think of these remarks today as a geography of left field, or a brief guidebook to what ecological thinking and reading entail over in my perch in Helen C. White. <clears throat> but in the spirit of my favorite field guide of late, a poem by this title um, by the trans poet Oliver Baez Bendorf in his most recent collection, Advantages of Being Evergreen, I am perhaps seeking less to orient you than to productively disorient all of us and to pose some questions in turn. What follows and unfolds in three parts, brief parts, I promise, <laughs> an overview of some general preoccupations in the humanistic field of queer ecologies, a discussion of my own current book project, and some pro provocations inspired by my teaching in the field. I'm calling this queer ecologies and other incongruous juxtapositions. To inquire after the possibility of a queer ecology is to engage in a practice of juxtaposition, one that is maybe incongruous, maybe redundant, maybe frictional, maybe something else entirely. Indeed, that phrase, queer ecology, which is not only a descriptor of the field I work in, but also the title of the graduate seminar I recently taught, is itself a grammatical chameleon. Is queer a noun, an adjective, a verb, an adverb? Is our task as creative stewards and thinkers to queer a normative ecology or a normative environmentalism, or to trace the myriad ways in which environmental relation may itself already be queer? I begin here for two reasons. First, because juxtaposition, putting things side by side, is for me not just a syntactic fact, but also a critical methodology. My work involves thinking sideways and asking what happens when bodies or temporalities or critical modes unexpectedly or non-normatively touch. So this can mean what happens when queer theory meets environmental thought, when the human touches the animal, when the past touches the present, when the human body comes into contact with a toxic environment, when the dead touches the living, when contemporary poetry reverberates against critical theory. Second, I start here because I think it's worth avowing that the more familiar name of the other field in which I work, the environmental humanities, is itself a complex and not entirely self-evident juxtaposition, one that might pose similar provocations, similar questions, similar challenges, and similar complexities as does queer ecology itself. The work of both of my fields, in other words, is animated by surprise meetings, 
by productive fiction, frictions and fictions, by the academic accidents that brought these fields together in the first place. So how does queer come into contact with environmental studies? I want to constellate this first portion of my remarks around one key concept that I think animates queer theory. It's investment in what we might deem a logic of non-inevitability. <clears throat> and so the clearest example of this from early queer theory is the simple but important observation that, for instance, XX chromosomes do not inevitably lead to female gender identity, do not inevitably lead to erotic attraction to someone of the opposite gender or sex. Queer theory, then, is often invested in a gesture of denaturalizing, of taking the things that we think are natural or normal or inevitable and demonstrating that they could have been, and even more importantly, already are and still can be otherwise. The power of this gesture is that it enables us to envision not only possibilities that are on the horizon, but also the alternatives already imminent within, as if stitched upon the backside of the present itself. The challenge for environmental or ecological thought, of course, involves what happens when we queerly denaturalize the thing called nature, or when we take issue with the way in which the very concept of the natural itself has been wielded ideologically, so as to render certain bodies and desires unnatural and thereby objected. One thing that queer ecology asks, then, is how we can challenge the natural while still caring for the environments that we call nature and how the former practice, the challenging, might in fact be integral to the latter, the care. To linger with the non-inevitable is also obviously to ask after temporal logics that don't, don't unfold in a linear march from past to present to future. Contemporary environmentalism famously concretizes its wished for future in the image of the innocent child <clears throat> and in a temporality marked out in future generations. And that's fundamental to everything from um, the greenwashing of products to sustainability's very definition. This understanding of futurity simultaneously seems to imagine the future as a fresh start, as if we could rid ourselves of, of the legacy of everything ranging from toxic flows to chattel slavery and often conjures for the public a familiar and familial future that will resemble the present as the biological child resembles the biological parent. But queer theory thinks the future elsewhere and otherwise, sometimes by denying it entirely, and sometimes, as my own work often does, by inviting us to think about the futures of seemingly futureless sites, so not the kind of innocent child, but the bedsides of the terminally ill amidst fleeting encounters that characterize practices of queer relation like cruising in the modes of relation that don't resolve themselves into production or reproduction. Queer theory might invite us to ask whether caring for the planet inevitably means caring about the future, or whether bracketing the question of futurity entirely might make new forms of environmental care and relation thinkable for the first time. Queer theory, in other words, can open us to the imminent ethical possibilities of the present itself, perhaps by helping us to articulate the many ways in which and the many grammars in which the future and past already or still press upon us here. With this, let me turn now to a more specific example of the kinds of intellectual and ethical gestures that I've been outlining thus far. For my current book project, titled Queer Lasting, is itself a gesture of non-inevitability, of insisting that things could be otherwise, in part because they already are. In it, I seek to denaturalize the most seemingly self-evident and the most seemingly necessary dimension of environmental politics and activism, that emphasis on the future. Or to put this another way, the entire project emerges from a single provocation. What has contemporary environmentalism's seemingly necessary interest in the future rendered unthinkable? Let me slow down and explain myself with the help of a concrete example. In his 1989 book, <clears throat> The End of Nature, widely credited with introducing the concept of global climate change to a mainstream audience, Bill McKibben accounted for Americans' hesitancy as environmental stewards by explaining that, quote, the end of nature makes us reluctant to attach ourselves to its remnants for the same reason that we usually don't choose friends from among the terminally ill. For an insistently futural political movement like environmentalism, which seeks to guarantee nothing less than the future of life itself and the future of the future itself, an illness that can't be healed 
like a planet that can't be thieved, seems to preclude for McKibben both successful activism and consequential care. Yet in 1989, at the end of a decade when the AIDS epidemic ravaged the queer community, tens of thousands of Americans were building lives precisely through befriending the terminally ill and developing creative forms of care and community in the process. The scene that for McKibben marks the outer limit of environmental thought and care proves to be the very ground of queer relation. And this dissonance is hardly exceptional. Many of the paradigms of futurelessness <clears throat> that mainstream environmentalism most deeply fears. So not only terminality, but also non-reproductivity, extinction, loss, failure, and transience, or kind of temporariness, constitute and even generate queer, ex queer existence. So inspired by queer forms of care, continuance, and collective endeavor, my book theorizes a mode of environmental stewardship that does not orient itself toward the future. It does so by juxtaposing two periods. And this is where it gets weird. It's not already. <laughs> the long 1890s and the long 1980s, when the queer community, as we now call it, found itself confronting extinction events. The first being the birth of the homosexual as a species, which extinguished extant forms of erotic affiliation that became illegible and largely impossible um, amidst the newly taxonomized understanding of sexuality, and the HIV and AIDS epidemic in the 1980s, whose terrifying spread threatened the total loss of not only gay lives, but also specific erotic ways of life. And there's a kind of paradox or irony, which is it is the birth of the homosexual as a species to take Foucault's formulation that rendered other forms of erotic life kind of um, obsolete or extinct. By engaging texts from these periods whose animating conditions of extinction bracket questions of futurity and vitality as typically lived, the project traces temporal, social, and hermeneutic possibilities that have proven unthinkable within environmentalism's futural imagination. In so doing, it also demonstrates what environmental thought can continue to learn from queer theory, a field that emerged precisely during the AIDS epidemic, a moment when queer life itself seemed acutely at risk of having no future, and that consequently, consequently imagines and inhabits the imminent ethical possibilities of the present. Whether confronting the AIDS crisis, theorizing the temporary encounters of cruising, or reckoning with the lives of non-reproductive subjects, <clears throat> queer writing consistently demonstrates how futurelessness can engender, as opposed to preclude, ethical engagement. Ultimately then, mine is a project about futurelessness that is also a project about persistence. For far from giving up in the face of paradigms that environmentalism phobically avoids, Queer culture has predicated its living and its lasting, its persistence upon them. The text in my archive does su suggest that bracketing the question of futurity may in fact be the best way, paradoxically, to respond to the environmental challenges that we face. For a fixation on the future, as typically defined in mainstream environmental discourse, not only privileges certain relational forms, so the mother, the innocent child, and the white nuclear family, but also prevents us often from attending to the subtler, more complex forms of persistence and possibility that populate and even constitute our present moment. This may bring us back finally to my title, <laughs> because queer lasting is for me a kind of pun, a word that indicates all the forms of persistence or lasting embodied by those who are, in the parlance of the late 19th century text that I read, at the last, so at the end of life, as the last in their family line in avowedly futureless paradigms of intimacy. Lasting, then, is a name both for the forms of persistence that interest me and for the forms of apparent futurelessness that paradoxically engender them. Importantly, and here it gets weird again, <laughs> lasting is also a gerund, a verbal form, which renders it quite different from the future, which is a static and still and stable noun. Um, lasting is a process dilated, uncertain, liable to change. Unlike the future, lasting can never arrive, whether in the form of a child or the future generation or in some other shape. And whereas the future as noun invites a set of conventional, grammatically transitive um, stewardship practices, so we can save the future or safeguard the future or protect the future or guarantee the future, an emphasis on lasting as opposed to future 
invites us to consider a range of other practices and habits of attention. Indeed, while bracketing the nominal future, and that just means future is now, that has determined many of environmentalism's privileged figures while delimiting its practices, the texts in my archive offer a repertoire of rhetorical forms and grammatical forms from which we can learn to inhabit environmental temporality otherwise. As my reference to Jaron's announce really already suggests, my attention in this project is often grammatical. I'm interested, weirdly, in all the ways that queer authors dwelling in the shadow of extinction <laughs> use inventive grammars to make legible the complex and tangled temporalities in which they live and die and commune and act up and care and write. For me, grammar, far from being the esoteric province of the schoolmarm, <laughs> is a technology for making new temporal and relational possibilities legible and thinkable, which is, of course, the first step to making them real. At this point, you're surely wondering what all of this has to do with ecology, especially since my objects of study are textual and social ones, and insofar as my instruments for making sense of the world are most frequently grammars <laughs> and other dimensions of literary form. But I, in fact, learned these habits of grammatical, grammatical attention, or rather learned the power of grammar as a technology of attention from another queer ecologist, one, was, one who was herself writing while terminally ill. I refer here to Rachel Carson, who was, of course, dying of breast cancer as she wrote her 1962 book, Silent Spring, and whose scientific work was often discredited on the basis of not only her gender and not only her literariness, but also of her non-reproductivity. In a 1963 letter to Dwight D. Eisenhower, former Secretary of Agriculture Ezra Taft Benson famously wondered, quote, why a spinster with no children was so concerned about genetics, <clears throat> and by extension, about the future itself. It may not be a coincidence that Benson's own answer was that she was probably a communist. For it was precisely the way in which her childlessness and her queerness excommunicated her from the capitalist vision of the future that the pesticide industry was both propagating and relying upon that enabled her to so skillfully limb the forms of indirect harm precipitated by chemical spraying. Her literariness, I want to suggest, is where we see her queerness meet her ecology. Let me outline what I mean quickly and very schematically. In a chapter of Silent Spring called The Human Price, Carson laments the inadequacy of scientific instruments in the face of the slow, indirect, delayed patterns of harm that interest her and that eco-critic Rob Nixon has more recently theorized under the rubric of slow violence. Quote, we are accustomed to look for the gross and immediate effect and to ignore all else. Unless this appears promptly and in such obvious form that it cannot be ignored, we deny the existence of hazard. Even research men suffer from the handicap of inadequate methods of detecting the beginnings of injury. The lack of sufficiently delicate methods to detect injury before symptoms appear is one of the great unsolved problems in medicine. Throughout Silent Spring, literary, literary language becomes for Carson the sufficiently delicate method that the research men lack. One that, if it cannot detect injury before symptoms erupt, can teach us to attend to forms of harm and scales and paces of change that often slip beneath the thresholds of human perception. In other words, if Carson is an early theorist of slow violence, then the instrument that helps her register and helps her help us register those often imperceptible forms of harm is the very literary language that was so often used to call the scientific validity of her argument into question. If for Carson, DDT proves not only an epidemi <clears throat> epidemiological and ecological problem, but also an epistemological one, a problem for thought, a problem for perception, then literary language helps her address the latter. There are innumerable examples of this, and I won't go into them, from her use of metaphor to her opening fable, to her allusions to the Brothers Grimm and the Adams family. Um, but what most interests me, perhaps unsurprisingly, is her grammar. <laughs> and I'll only project this slide for now, not read it, but I want to suggest, as I have elsewhere, that through her interplay of transitive and intransitive verbs, through her implicit transformation of periods into ellipses, and we see that how she continues all these sentences with the green ands, Carson trains her readers to keep looking beyond the initial scene of pesticide spraying 
and to trace indirect effects. The project of recognizing slow violence and indirect causality, in other words, is also a project of reading beyond the apparent end of the sentence. And here, too, my interest in terminality might return, not only because Carson was theorizing environmental futurity while inhabiting the foreclosures of her own future, but also because in the very structure of her language, Carson encourages us to read beyond the nominal end of an event, turning an apparent terminus, in this case a literal period, into a space of risk and possibility alike. So I want to end where I fleetingly began, with the work of poet Oliver Baez Bendorf. For Bendorf recombines so many of the threads I have engaged thus far, the question of queerness and the natural, the mutual imbrication of risk and possibility, the confounding of normative futures or teleological narratives, the intricacies of temporal and physical scale, the complex work of queer ecological care, and the way in which literary language can reshape what it is possible to think, to do, to make, and to be. And so too does the trans poet Bendorf let things unexpectedly touch, as he finds in the landscape of the upper Midwest and often Madison itself, the paradoxical shape of the newborn man, asking us in turn what it means to think environmental and community coming side by side. In his two collections of poetry, Bendorf had a sense of his own nonlinear experience of gender transition via recourse to the material world, inviting us to think the body ecologically or geologically, and in turn to understand the land's own transformations and striations and histories as themselves reflecting a body in transition albeit a transition happening at a pace illegible to the human eye. So across the collection, to provide just a few examples, he engages in a practice of cross-species biomimicry, learning how to be a man not from human beings, <clears throat> but from the male wren, the barred owl, and three castrated goat birds, a process that, in his words, makes his masculinity in red animal at best. <clears throat> and looks to glaciated Iowa, not only for models of transformation, but also for traces of what remains amidst them, geodes and fossils and brachiopods on the land, and in his own body, the image of his younger self twirling in a gauzy blue dress in the afternoon sun. And throughout, he engages the reader as intimate other, as part and parcel of a transition that is as relational as it is deeply personal. We are hardly permitted as readers to be neutral, distant observers, in other words, or to put either these bodies or these poems, two entities that he explicitly says can never be separated, under a medicalizing or taxonomic or purely analytic gaze. Rather, our own bodies are implicated in and transformed by the very process of reading. Take Outing Iowa, for instance, the poem to which I was just referring, and I'll just read the parts in bold. If you've ever doubted that a body can transform completely, take the highway north from town. Can I tell you? The land where I was born was born an ocean, and that ocean born of ice. I still bleed, still weep. What we used to be matters. Here's a brachiopod. Here's me twirling in a gauzy blue, blue dress in the afternoon sun. Trace these fossils with your tongue and place them in my hands, which will never be any larger. Lay your ear against an iceberg while there's time and sing to me its trickle. Lift a geode from the ground and crack me open. I'll sparkle so hard you'll forget, this, you'll, forget, you'll forget you thought this land was flat, as though you'd never find the valley, bedrock, ancient sea. As we trace these fossils with our tongue and crack the geode of his self open, we find ourselves trusted by a poet we have never met to take care of him and his sparkling, vulnerable, unpredictable experiences of change. This can, in turn, be thus to the final poem in the collection, Take Care, which is also where I want to conclude. In a book that is deeply preoccupied by what, by what Bendorf calls make-believe, which for him is both noun and verb, both the work of child's play or imagination and the work of making the self and others believe, it is perhaps only fitting that he ends his collection with a complex prayer that trusts as much in the power of language as anything else. I need deliverance. Good God, take me, mistake me, back to the soft shoulder, which I mistake so often for the road itself. 
in a collection of intensely intricate and resounding poems, where the road can't be torn apart from the shoulder, where the soft shoulder returns us to the small hands with which the collection begins, where mistake functions not just as a noun, but also as a verb, becoming like queer itself, a grammatical chameleon. We readers are invited to be as open to our own mistakes and our own detours or accidents, as is the speaker, including in our practice of reading and witnessing the poets and the environment's transformations. So this is where I want to close with a queer ecological invitation to make mistakes, to be surprised, to do things far outside our own areas of expertise, to dare to mistake the soft shoulder for the road and find our way through or around or back nevertheless. And so I invite you to read poems with me, <laughs> to become grammarians, to ask what we might do and who we might become if the future as we think we know it is not the primary locus of our work and our activism. And I look forward to learning from you in turn where I might take and mistake myself. Thank you. Time for maybe one or two questions. So from the chat, we have, thank you for the fabulous presentation. Like you said, your examples came from literature and Rachel Carson. Can you share or maybe better yet imagine for us an example from environmental or ecological or agricultural practice slash activism slash work? or from the area of environmental remediation or from indigenous practice slash activism? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a big question. <laughs> I may think about it during the next um, presentation so I have a better answer. I mean, I think one thing I would say is that I don't, the reason I'm attached to grammar <laughs> is not because I think it's esoteric or purely in the world of the text. I think that grammars are also kind of choreographies for living. <laughs> And I think certain practices, um, especially practices that are about um, our relationship to the past, also presume certain, um, certain grammars. And so my interest, for instance, in transitivity and intransitivity is in part a grammar of, um, of resisting a model of containment that I think transitive verbs often invoke, right? So we cast the future as something out there that is not yet touching us, that we are trying to like save or make possible or make emerge. And likewise, we tend to cast in a kind of protective vein, grammatically, the past as something over and over, right? And so one thing I think is thinking about um, intransitive verbs of persistence as being a way of reckoning with not only how um, forms of harm from the past, but also possibilities from the past are still present. And I'll, I'll think of more concrete examples um, from life and ecological practice. Well, maybe if I make, can yeah. make a comment, maybe very simplistic, because I'm not sure I follow it, but very interesting. When we think of, uh, or we try to measure in ecology, in fitness, we, we have a term that is about growth or reproduction, yeah. but the other component is persistence. Yes. And so and that's very interesting to me because the focus on that persistence and what allows persistence at multiple temporal scales at a level of an ecosystem definitely brings you into the past. Yes. yes. And the diversity from which we can build the current diversity today. And, and that's something I'll touch upon, but, but I think it resonates. We're, we're no, trying to focus on persistence really sees the, the importance of the past and what we are losing, which is uh, which is uh, a very, very long time in building. Yes, no, thank you for that. Well, in the interest of time, I think maybe we should... Thanks, there again. Thanks so much. All right, uh, well, so our next speaker is Dr. Misa Karimi. Uh, Dr. Karimi is a research associate and lecturer in the Department of Botany here at UW-Madison. Um, after her undergraduate studies at Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, that included what sounded like 
fascinating undergraduate thesis on Peruvian agroecosystems and some time uh, spent working professionally in land management. Dr. Kirimi um, earned her PhD here at UW-Madison in 2019, and she is a botanist and evolutionary biologist interested in the remarkable diversity of plants and how this diversity has evolved and consistent with the conversation we were just ha uh, having, how it persists over time. Um, and her research interests include uh, both understanding the mechanisms of plant diversification across scales from population populations um, on up, but also the practical implications of that fundamental science for questions in conservation, including the importance of species uh, delimitations. And so today, <laughs> timing her talk is titled Spatial Variation in the Pollination Ecology of the African Baobab, Adansonia Digitata, hopefully vaguely close to the correct pronunciation. Uh, so please join me in, in welcoming Dr. Kirimi. This is actually a project I've never had the pleasure of speaking about before, so I'm thrilled to finally talk about it. Um, I apologize for the dry title. It, I am speaking about spatial variation in the pollination of ecology of the African baobab. And then I'm going to focus on how um, this variation actually explains broader macroevolutionary patterns in the broader um, baobab lineage. So, Plant pollinator interactions, I would say, is a broad interest to ecologists and evolutionary biologists alike. Um, it has long been hypothesized that pollinators um, are important drivers to angiosperm diversification. And this idea dates back to Darwin, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it. And it remains an important research topic um, still today. And there's really mounting evidence that indicates that pollinators have the potential um, to drive diversification at varying scales. Um, of evolution. I'm going to use the clicker. There we go. Um, so at the macroevolutionary le macro level, there's a general consensus that diversification of angiosperms was driven by pollinators. And this is based on cumulative evidence from phylogenetic studies. So when we look across the angiosperm phylogeny, which I'm depicting here with this graphic, um, we observe this pattern of convergent evolution of a suite of floral traits. So here, um, the circles represent a suite of floral traits. This would be floral morphology, floral color, floral scent. And there's this reoccurring pattern where you have this similar suite of floral traits, and that it's associated with a primary pollinator. And these patterns we refer to um, as pollination syndromes. And so, for example, the bee pollination syndrome is often characterized by having brightly colored, sweet-smelling flowers with visible nectar guides, visible either to the naked eye or under UV spectrum. Um, Moth-pollinated flowers typically have um, pale-colored flowers, abundant nectar, um, sweet scents emitted at night, and um, you know, hummingbird pollination um, syndrome is and flowers often have red um, flowers. So these patterns we've observed um, over and over and over again, but plant diversification occurs along a continuum, right, from, from, from populations um, to higher taxonomic levels. So this is a continuum over space and time. And so these patterns at the macroevolutionary scale is really the result of processes that occur at the ecological scale. Um, because selection happens at the population level. And so given that, we might expect to see um, abundant intraspecific variation in species ranges that could serve as the precursor to um, species divergence. So for example, um, we could look at differences in pollinator visitation rates. There could be differences in ecological niche. Um, differences in floral traits across species ranges, genetic structure, and of course many times these differences are linked and as we move through evolutionary time they become much more prominent, right? And this is, these macroevolutionary studies that look at this um, are really of, of, of um, a hot research topic today. So this, um, when I opened my email just about an hour and a half ago, these are some papers that are just published uh, looking at spatial variation in reproductive traits um, and pollinators across species ranges. So I am particularly interested in how variation within a population or, or within a species 
can explain these broader macroevolutionary patterns. And so today I'm going to present a case study regarding baobab pollination to help explain how shifts in pollination systems could occur and how um, diversification um, can occur given these um, spatial variations. So my story starts with the African baobab. So the baobabs are, are, is actually a, a genus of, of eight currently described species. The African baobab is probably the most um, well-known. It occurs widespread across continental Africa. It is of great ecological, cultural, um, and economic importance. So these trees are massive figures on the landscape. Um, there's a number of different um, um, sacred rituals associated with them across their ranges, a lot of folklore associated with them. They're often considered keystone species to the African savanna. Uh, and a lot of the communities where the baobabs grow are really reliant on these trees. Um, um, and a lot of these products are sold at local markets, both informal, but also now on the international level. So um, international uh, exports to the United States uh, if baobab products has actually grown 6% annually over the last 10 years. So these trees um, possess floral traits classically associated with bat pollination. So these trees have these massive white flowers um, that are, they hang down on these long um, stalks and they flower before the onset of the rainy season while the trees are still leafless. An individual tree flower, um, flowers for about a month, and they can produce hundreds of flowers on some of the, the larger trees. But each individual flower, which is again about the size of a small grapefruit, um, is only receptive for a single night. And so if you're doing um, experimental studies on these trees, you go out into the field late in the afternoon and you have to look for the um, the cracking of the calyx, the flower bud, as I'm showing in the photograph on the top there. And then literally as the sun is setting, these buds peel open and you can watch these flowers just emerge over the course of 30 minutes to an hour. And by early the next morning, these flowers are already wilting and falling from the tree. So if you're out at the field site early in the morning, it literally feels, and it is, raining baobab flowers all around you. So given the ecological and ethnobotanical importance and really popularity of these trees now, um, it's surprising that a lot of questions still remain about their pollination biology. So bats have been observed in some populations, in particular um, in far West Africa, and there was some historical reports of bat pollination occurring in coastal Kenya. Um, but otherwise, there has been no reports of bat pollination occurring in southern Africa, and a lot of research happens with the baobab trees in southern Africa. Another interesting observation of populations in southern Africa is there's this huge discrepancy in the size of fruits that are being produced there. So a lot of the local communities um, in southern Africa are, are part of the international export trade, and so they rely on these trees for their livelihood. And baobabs in West Africa, and I regret not bringing one now, <laughs> are about this large. Um, and in Southern Africa, they can be really quite small, as you can see sort of a, the difference of fruit set um, in the photograph here. And so this really brings um, it, the questions are, you know, who are the primary pollinators of the baobab trees, in particular in Southern Africa, where there's been no documentation and folks living and working there, have never never seen, um, observed a, a bat pollinating baobabs there. And what's causing these differences in fruit set? So to answer these questions, um, I worked on mostly communal lands in South Africa, but not all. So here's just a, a smattering of images of the individual trees that I worked on. Um, and so this took place, this project took place over two um, flowering seasons, so two years. And these sites represent the southernmost part of their range. So this is the Limpopo province of South Africa that borders um, Mozambique, Botswana, and uh, Zimbabwe. So um, we set out to conduct pollination experiments and then observed floral visitors. And what I found was really quite surprising. So I did not observe 
a single bat, which was really disappointing, I'll say. Not a single bat was ever observed visiting these flowers. Um, I saw greater bush babies, which is the photograph on the left there. I saw lesser bush babies um, and a, a, a lot of hawk moths. So um, it is possible, of course, that you know, my presence in the tree canopy was um, deterring bats from visiting. So we also set up um, motion-triggered wildlife cameras. And we obtained hundreds of images. And again, not a single bat. Um, again, bush babies <laughs> and hawk moths. And so this was really surprising, but what this would suggest is that hawk moths are the, are, are the primary pollinators. But of course, you know, we need some more evidence for that. Um, with the help of local children who were very enthusiastic about this, we were able to capture and identify the hawk moths that were visiting. And we did identify three different species of hawk moths. And hawk moths visited at a rate of about four visits per flower per hour. And this was based um, on observations, and this was also based on the, the camera trap images as well. So some of the um, additional floral visitors that were observed were settling moths, ants, bees, unidentified beetles. Um, and they are, we, we I expected them to be nectar robbers um, because they're so small in size. I mean, the baobab pollen is really large and sticky. Um, and a lot of those smaller visitors often forage within a tree canopy. And so to, to, to get at the question of could these smaller visitors also be um, potential pollinators, which has been hypothesized, and you'll find information about this all over the internet saying that bees are pollinators, we set up some experiments that could test you know, secondary lines of evidence. So we tested for the possibility of asexual reproduction. Um, so this is when fertilization occurs, uh, um, excuse me, sexual re reproduction occurs without fertilization in plants. And we tested for a possibility of self-compatibility. So this is when an individual can um, fertilize itself. And these two are found in distant relatives of the baobabs. It had never been studied before in baobabs. Um, so we also looked at differences in receptivity by doing crossing experiments in the daytime and then at nighttime. Because bees were an abundant um, visitor in the morning hours. So we wanted to check if there's possibility of, of receptivity in morning hours in Southern Africa. And then we did some exclusion experiments. So we excluded what would be bats and hawk moths using um, these uh, chicken wire cages that we constructed. So we had cages that excluded all, um, all of the larger visitors, so excluding bats and hawk moths. And then we ex built these cages where we would allow for hawk moths but exclude from bats. Um, and then we had a, had a control for comparison. And so what we found, starting on the right-hand side here with the box, um, we found no evidence for apomixis, uh, sexual, asexual reproduction. We found no evidence of these trees being um, self-compatible. Um, so there was no um, self-compatibility. We found that receptivity reduces dramatically by morning. So conducting, comparing crosses that were done at night versus crosses that were done in the daytime, early morning hours, um, only about 5% of the trees, or excuse me, 5% of the flowers that were crossed in the morning um, produced fruit, compared to 71% of our flowers um, that set fruit when crossed at nighttime. And then finally, looking at the exclusion experiment. So there's pictures of the cages there on the left-hand side. When we excluded hawk moths, so allowing for a lot of those smaller insects to access the flowers, none of our, our flowers set fruit. And if you contrast that with um, excluding just bats, about 7% of the flowers set fruit. And that was um, within the range of normality compared to our control. So about 9% of open flowers that we tagged did indeed set fruit. So taken together, I would say this suggests that hawk moths are the primary pollinators, at least in these populations in South Africa. So we also looked at floral scent profiles um, by using a headspace absorption technique to capture and identify volatile organic compounds by use of GCMS. And we found 
um, a number of sulfur-containing compounds. We actually found four different sulfur-containing compounds. And these are typically sort of a, a musky fragrance that are um, have been commonly isolated in bat-pollinated lineages from the neotropics. And so these are known to be a part of bat-pollinated um, pollination sy syndromes in the neotropics. What's interesting is there's been some study done that these sulfur compounds attract, attract new world bats um, even without a reward. So there's an innate attraction to these compounds in the new world. Um, but what's interesting is some work that was done um, in West Africa, but, um, they did find these sulfur compounds in the African baobab in West Africa, but none of the other species of bat pollinated um, trees in West Africa produced these compounds. So it was unique in terms of the floral profiles of bat pollination in uh, West Africa. So probably the biggest surprise um, was the presence of these sweet smelling terpenoids. So this beta caryophyllene was a compound that we isolated and it accounted for something like 50 to 70% of the compounds in the floral profile. And these were not detected by the researchers that looked at baobabs in Western Africa. And so it was unique to our population and we collected samples two years in a row. Um, at first, I thought there must be a mistake. There's contamination somewhere. Um, but we do believe that this, um, th this, is a tr this is a true compound that's found just in the baobab populations of Southern Africa. Um, and some previous work that had looked at number a number of different lineages that are hawk moth pollinated find that beta caryophylline and other sesquiterpenes are actually a very common compound in, an, in hawk moth pollinated um, plants. So I would say that these results suggest either an ongoing or an incomplete shift between bat pollination and hawk moth pollination, perhaps correlated with differences in um, floral scent at the con continental scale. And what's interesting is this variation in floral scent um, and, and pollinators actually parallels some work that was previously done where we looked at genetic structure of populations across continental Africa. And so these, the, this variation sort of um, mirrors each other. I was hoping to have some new um, data by, by today, but I'm currently investigating um, dating the divergence between these populations to get a sense of how long these populations um, have been isolated. And the, some of the preliminary um, results suggest that this population structure actually mirrors that of the megafauna in Africa that have thought to have been historical dispersal agents of baobabs across the continent, which I think is pretty cool. but. Um, like I said, that's a work in progress. So in the African baobab, despite having floral traits classically associated with bat pollination, seems to have some fluidity in its pollination system. And within the, um, the, the genus Adansonia, the baobab genus, we've observed this previous, um, previously. So now we have evidence that at least in South Africa, um, trees are primarily pollinated by hawk moths. There's been evidence that even though hawk moths are the primary pollinators of two species of baobabs found in Madagascar, um, I'm sorry, uh, lemurs are the primary pollinators of two species in Madagascar, but they're also visited by hawk moths. And some, some work that was done in baobabs in Australia found that although baobabs have in Australia are primarily pollinated by hawk moths, um, there's at least one population that's shown to be pollinated by flying foxes, bats of Australia. And so I think hopefully um, what this illustrates is that this, this um, mobility of pollination systems might be the key to transitions um, and ultimately diversification in the baobabs. So baobabs genealogical history suggests multiple transitions in pollination systems. So all of the baobabs have these um, really massive fragrant flowers. They all are nocturnally pollinated, um, but their primary pollinators um, have shifted over time. And 
the, the um, species that share a pollinator are not each other's closest relatives. So there's been multiple shifts between um, mammal and bat pollination in this lineage. And I think if we look at sort of this interspecific variation of floral traits and pollination um, within a species, it helps explain some of these um, broader macroevolutionary patterns. Um, so with that, I want to thank um, my funding. Like I said, this was a, a side project that I started many, many years ago now um, as part of my um, dissertation work that was funded by USAID um, through a project with the Graduate Research Fellowship Program. So um, I'm thankful to them and all of the communities in Southern Africa that were very enthusiastic about this work and um, very supportive. So I wanted to leave time for questions, and I think I did. So thank you. I think we have time for one or two questions. Um, so, so going back to the beginning when we were talking about the difference in food size, was there is there like a correlation between like the bats or like more completely fertilizing the flowers? Like that's why there's larger fruits versus the hawk moth. Pollinating less of the, the, the ovary of the flower. Yep, that's exactly the idea. So if you think about a bat, they have much larger <coughs> size, so they can carry a lot more pollen on them, um, as opposed to hawk moths being you know, really quite small, and so the amount of pollen that they would collect is much smaller. So that could explain why so many of the fruits are so small. Um, you know, the question really that isn't answered though is why are there still some large fruits in South Africa being produced? And maybe bats are coming the end of the flowering season when we're not there. I mean, it's hard to say, but um, researchers who work on these trees often and the communities there have never seen a bat. So, thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm curious about the I don't want the, it yeah. looked to me like, I'm wondering if I'm interpreting right, that the, so the nocturnal crossing experiments had relatively high really success, high. but the, even the controls had a relatively low. So is right. the interpretation right that they're pretty substantially pollinator limited? Limited, yeah. exactly. Right, it was something like the, you know, the, um, the controls are something like 9%, but cross-pollination was almost 80%. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you can imagine the amount of pollen that I'm like loading on there. Yeah. <laughs> so there is a degree of limitation. Yeah. 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 The, East Afri the East African highlands have a different haplotype. That's true. Exactly. What's yeah, story? I don't know. I don't know. Um, that's something that I'm working on right now, actually. But they do have a very distinct haplotype, which is interesting because um, I didn't want to bring this up, but I should. So there was um, a paper that came out that described a new species of baobab in in, this, in that part of Tanzania, actually, um, and that's since been repeated. Um, but it does have this unique genotype. So um, I don't know. I don't know why that is yet. Yeah. Um, out of curiosity, what are the, um, do you have any sense of what um, South African, Tanzania, you said, and Angola, West African um, indigenous groups think of this tree and how that might intersect or not with the kind of science you're conducting? How, what do they think of the tree? Yeah, what are the um, sorts of natural histories or ecologies that they're working with and could they intersect with what you're doing? Oh yeah, so I work with a lot of different collaborators all across continental Africa. Right, if, yeah. yeah. And I just was curious if there's, I so, they have about the ecology of this group. Yeah, so we put together a Baobab Blitz, actually, which we're, so we, um, so we asked the community to actually sit out under trees for a number of different flowering periods to get a sense and to record what was, what was visiting. Um, and they didn't see any bats visiting. And this was, I mean, we had something like two to 300 participants in the Blitz. Um, and so, um, they're excited to continue this work, but um, as of now. So they had no previous ideas about these trees? I mean, I guess I'm asking what are their previous ideas about these trees and the sorts of um, ecologies around these trees that might not neatly sync up with Darwinian theories. I mean, just, or maybe so, there weren't such ideas. I don't think they're widely cultivated. Well, so I would say that, the, the, you know, they've, they've evolved under, these trees evolved under bat pollination. Um, 
pretty, I would say pretty clearly that based on, you know, phylogenetic framework and then work that was done in West Africa, they would say that the floral syndrome fits despite having this, either this shift or this retention of beta caryophylline in the profiles um, of Southern Africa, which is interesting. But otherwise, I would say the trees evolved with, with bat pollination. Um, and it seems most likely that actually um, the Southern African populations are the most recently diverged, just based on that preliminary or, um, results of the study I'm working on right now. I don't know if that answered your question, but. Well, let's say thanks Thank one more you. time. Thank you. And so uh, now just as a quick reminder, again, ahead of um, the next talk, which will be our last one for the afternoon, there will be uh, food and some refreshments. I don't know if in here or very close by. Um, yeah. So it is my absolute pleasure today to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Mercedes Pasquale, who's joining us um, from the University of Chicago, um, where she is currently the Lewis Bloch Professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolution and leads the Laboratory for Modeling and Theory in Ecology and Epidemiology, uh, or nicknamed the MATE Lab, certainly one of my favorite uh, lab acronyms. <laughs> um, so originally from Uruguay, Dr. Pascual earned her PhD at MIT and then was a postdoctoral fellow at Princeton University and before coming to University of Chicago, was on the faculty at the University of Maryland and the University of Michigan. And so Dr. Pascual has really done groundbreaking work, especially in the interface of uh, mathematical and theoretical ecology and focusing on the dynamics of complex biological and ecological systems. Um, and that work has, has been broad ranging. I think we're going to hear some of that scope today, but especially um, that work has really included groundbreaking work illuminating the linkages between climate change and the ecology and evolution of infectious diseases. Um, and for that work, she has received, received numerous honors and distinctions and awards, uh, including the Robert H. MacArthur Award from the Ecological Society of America, uh, membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, um, recognition as one of the 50 most important women in science uh, by Discover Magazine, and a centennial fellowship from the James S. McDonald Foundation, among many other distinctions. So, uh, we're just thrilled that uh, Dr. Pasquale has come to join us today. She'll be giving a keynote today and a keynote tomorrow. Um, and her talk today is titled, The Structure of Hyperdiversity and Niche Emergence in Host Pathogen Systems. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Pasquale. Yes, it's a bad day to be Uruguayan. We just lost against Portugal, for those of you who are so <laughs> so so And um, yes, so uh, let me start with uh, by acknowledging the two postdocs who uh, have now moved on to their respective faculty positions, but who uh, helped, uh, were part of the theory I'll talk about today. And I'd like to start with a quote by Simon Levine, who wrote, the fundamental problems in the study of any complex system are understanding what maintains diversity and how the existence of diversity affects system dynamics. It is these three features, heterogeneity, frequency dependence, and modularity, read structure, that complicate the picture and will occupy most of my attention for the rest of the paper, and indeed for the rest of my talk. The challenge to theory is to explain diversity where it is truly vast. And of course, we have a large body of work in this area, which I like to classify into these two camps broadly. At one end, we have an emphasis on stochastic assembly, essentially birth as processes of immigration and extinction in the work of theory of island, in the theory of island biogeography of MacArthur and Wilson. And the very insightful successor, the neutral theory of ecology by Steve Hubble. Here, species, species differences do not matter. We do not need to invoke them. At the opposite end, we have an emphasis on specific interactions that depend, of course, on differences between species. We just heard a fabulous example about that. We have mutualism, competition, ideas of niche partitioning, limits to similarity, etc. And in this camp, 
we have this very influential hypothesis, the johnson connell hypothesis, which invokes specialized interactions with specific natural enemies that lead to essentially higher mortality close to conspecifics. And here, an advantage of the rare, a disadvantage of the common, leading to frequency dependence. So this can, of course, lead to uh, sustained diversity. It's an, imp an important hypothesis. There is a lot of work looking at these mechanisms in rainforest. But the key problem is not whether these kinds of processes occur. The key question is not whether there are differences between species. The problem is to connect those processes and say those are important to the patterns of diversity and at what scale. So here, I would say that the major impediment in terms of, for example, rejecting neutral theory, which after all, it's a no model, is to identify patterns in the structure of diversity that are truly informative, statistical patterns of the ensemble that are truly informative about the importance of underlying processes, ecological processes in the interaction of individuals. I like to, uh, and here theory can help. Theory can help us uh, identify signatures that can tell us whether particular processes are at play and are important to the diversity. So I'd like to give you an example of that today, in particular on the role of negative frequency-dependent competition. I'll refer to this as also negative frequency-dependent selection. And I will uh, do this in the context of intraspecific diversity, not interspecific. If I had an example, I would love it, but it will be uh, for now uh, at that level. And in fact, I think that's an area uh, I, I really like the, the focus on intraspecific diversity. I think we have neglected it and the way it can play uh, in linking uh, amongst case of organization. I'll show you that uh, network signatures are, are kinds of patterns that can tell us about this and then move the, in the second part of the talk uh, to talk about the relationship of diversity at different levels of organization to show you how this can lead to threshold behavior in diversity and abundance that is related to the ability of a system to accumulate innovation. And I will be talking about strains of a pathogen and genes because this is about infectious diseases and it is intraspecific. So I, I will try to return at the end and generalize. Uh, I hope that if you are not particularly interested in the ecology of infectious diseases, uh, you can um, see this f as an example of something we can perhaps generalize, because after all, equoevolutionary dynamics has very few ingredients. We just need individual phenotypes that are combination of traits. We need to understand ecological interactions as a function of similarity among those phenotypes. We have some stochastic dynamics of abundance in a local system, and then some uh, stochastic innovation, either by immigration from a regional pool or some um, evolutionary processes. And again, if you don't particularly care about infectious diseases, I like to emphasize they are consumer resource systems for ecology. They are. The consumer are the infections. The resources are the susceptible individuals. And um, when they get consumed by infection, they acquire immunity and they are removed from the pool of resources. So this is a consumer resource system. We are all familiar with SIR models and their tendency to oscillate. But the advantage we have besides the, the rapid temporal scales for us to observe evolution is that we know which traits matter to competition for hosts. These are the variant surface antigens in the surface of the pathogens. The variation in the molecules that the immune system sees, an example of influenza. And in fact, this trait variation sets up uh, essentially this uh, competition for hosts that is negative frequency dependence. There is an advantage of being rare, a disadvantage of being common. And if you think about it, if you are a pathogen and carry certain uh, 
variants in your surface, certain antigens, you are in competition with, some, with another pathogen, another strain that is similar to you because if a host has acquired memory to uh, one of those pathogens, is no lo it is no longer available to the other one. We understand the interaction of ecology and evolution in these kinds of systems. We understand the kinds of uh, genealogies that can be generated. I just have here the classical example of the tree of H3 and 2 influenza. The different colors are different uh, strain types that replace each other. Interestingly, if you take one of those computational models, as we did in this paper, and generate those kinds of dynamics in silico, you can switch those patterns very easily to coexistence. These are two clades that join in the back. I just cut it to more stable dynamics simply by speeding the rate of evolution, the rate of mutation, or strengthen, strengthening competition. So you can understand this going back to purely ecological competition in the early models of Sunetra Gupta, where she considered, and this is just a little diagram, but of course you can do this with more loci. Uh, imagine two genetic loci that encode for two variant, uh, two variant each. So you have X1 and X2, Y1 and Y2, and pathogens can carry these combinations. The ones that would coexist at equilibrium would not overlap because the ones that do partially overlap are at a disadvantage. So what has occurred is an emergence of niches by which the population of hosts is now subdivided into two kinds of resources with different histories of, or different memory of infection. So niches have emerged in the same sense that for some of you who may follow the work of Peter Chesson, he talks of stabilizing competition, and he makes a very important distinction among traits that confer an advantage as a function purely of frequency from those. So these ones, um, again, there is here an advantage of the rare, disadvantage of the common. These lead to coexistence, while if you have traits that give you absolute advantages, they lead to exclusion. And in fact, we understand these kinds of things for a few species, a few traits. There is great theory, but this uh, very insightful review pointed out, we do not understand these kinds of dynamics in very large spaces of variation. And this is what interests me here, not not to play Lego, but to point out that the, I will be talking about a host pathogen system that lives in a very large space of variation. And I'm going to claim by the end of the talk that if you have very large diversity at one level, you necessarily have very large diversity at the lower level. And that this is very, very important for many things. So this is the charismatic uh, pathogen um, well, the plasmodium uh, falciparum parasite uh, of malaria, we know it has a complex life cycle. It's transmitted by mosquito vectors. It has a sexual phase in the mosquito and a sexual phase in humans. For our perspective, and to talk about diversity, I'm going to focus on one major antigen, the major antigen of the blood stage of infection, I cannot pronounce the whole name. It's something like, well, let's call it PFEM PA1. One, it's a molecule. And it's the major, as I said, it's not the only antigen. Of course, malaria has many antigens that are more conserved. This one is hypervariable. It's hypervariable because it is encoded by a number of genes. So each genome of a parasite will carry 50 to 60 genes that produce the same molecule but variants of the same molecule. They export it to the surface of the red blood cell, and it has several functions. For example, uh, it makes the red blood cell stick to the microvasculature, but what matters for us, it, it is exposed to the immune system. So having many, uh, many genes is a combinatorial strategy of immune evasion. But for us, think of a phenotype as a combination. 
And what is interesting is the parasite uh, sequentially expresses these genes in an infection. But if you have seen the product of one of these genes before, you, the parasite does not express it. It shortens infection. It reduces the fitness of the parasite. And so, OK, that's nice. If you ask, in a local population in West Africa under high transmission, how many different genes is, are there in a local population? My colleague Karen Day, a molecular epidemiologist, has shown that this can be of the order of tens of thousands of types if you look just at sequence divergence defined to a certain level. So enormous combinatorial possibilities. And indeed, the parasite relies on these combinatorics because it can recombine the genes in the mosquito if two parasites find themselves together. It can also recombine the genes in the uh, asexual phase and truly generate innovation through recombination. Now, you have this enormous variation that you can recombine. Certainly, you, there cannot, well, certainly, a question is, can there be structure in this, in this space? And before I go into that question of ca can there be a signature of competition for host in this mess, I'd like to point out that it possibly matters because under very high transmission, the malaria system is incredibly resilient to intervention. And the main reason for this is strain diversity. So if you go to one of these places in West Africa, and uh, take blood from people who are not in the hospital, just people in the villages, you can find 40 to 7%, 70% of the people carrying the parasite asymptomatically. This is only possible in a place under high transmission because immunity is partial. Immunity is partial because there is high diversity. So this is an incredibly resilient system. And I like to uh, claim that the interaction of ecology and evolution is fundamental to this. So let me go to the first part and convince you that not only there is structure, but it has to do with uh, a an, uh, frequency-dependent uh, competition. First, in terms of structure, I like this, uh, this, uh, results, this result. Uh, it's now a little bit old. With my colleague Karen Day, we took the repertoires of genes she had isolated from sampling all the children in village in uh, Pakumba, Gabon, a place of high transmission. And what we are doing here is considering every isolate, so for each child that was infectious, and then uh, the same here, and just counting. What, how much overlap is there in the infection of one child and another? That quantity per wise type sharing just measures the overlap. All you need to know is that uh, it is extremely low. So each child is carrying its own strain, almost. And you can use, well, first you think this is incredible, then you say this is trivial, because if you give me lots of pieces, then overlap is going to be very low. But you can randomize conserving frequencies and lengths, and then find that the mean overlap from the randomized distribution, sorry, from the data, is lower than in the randomized distribution. So something is making the overlap even lower than you expect just from having many pieces. But OK, this tells you there is no random structure. We are not so interested in non-random. We would like to know if it is non-neutral. And this is not the same, because uh, here we are just mixing things. But biology doesn't just mix things. There is demography, the demography of transmission. And so what you want is to compare the system to exactly the same system, but without competition, which for us mean, means the same system, but without 
memory, specific memory. So what we did is to do this in a simulation to look at what could give away that this system is not neutral in the sense of Hubble neutral. So we have our model. It's an individual-based model where each host has a memory of the previous infections. And the length of immunity depends on the We then have two neutral models. In the complete neutrality, there is just a constant duration. So you get infected and you recover. And this one is a bit more meaningful epidemiologically. You don't remember specifically what you saw, but you remember how many infections. And therefore, you are protected by how many infections. Well, does it matter? So we have a model. I said it's individual based, so just to give you a general sense. There is contact rate between uh, individuals, some transmission, some immigration from a regional pool. And without going into details, we have uh, recombination. We have also the generation of novelty, as I mentioned before, through uh, getting new pieces together. But I wanted to show you that one way we can see the structure of limiting similarity is to now look at networks of similarity between pathogens. So you can take each pathogen, imagine 50 traits. If you don't like to think of our genes, think of your preferred traits. And then you, each point is an individual. And what you are measuring here is uh, a measurement of how many types you share, how many traits you share. We just do it in two directions because you of some asymmetry in repeating types. That doesn't matter a lot. And we threshold this network to show you just the links that are the strongest, because after all, we want to see the, the parasites that are competing with each other that are most similar. Now, if we do this and generate networks under our different scenarios for some medium regional pool of diversity, immediately you see that the kinds of networks are really different. And by the way, this one is the one under frequency dependent selection. And you can see clusters. Those clusters are your niches, uh, in a sense, of similar pathogens that rely on subpopulations of the host. These two other kinds of networks are more tree-like because they have the demography of transmission. Well, but if you go to, to, to the higher pool of diversity of high transmission regions, well, it becomes harder. And indeed, by eye, it, you can perhaps see some differences, but do the patterns look different? The networks have similar properties. For example, the degree distribution is the same, the number of uh, links per node, right? So we did the following. We can simulate and simulate and ask a computer, essentially ask uh, a classifier, to recognize which scenario generated the network. Essentially, if a sort of data science approach can separate them, then we can find uh, essentially what separates them. And we can ask from empirical, uh, from em empirical uh, data, essentially, whether there is evidence for one regime or another. So the classifier we use, without going into details, is a nice uh, method known as discriminant analysis of principal components. Doesn't matter what it is. People use it to look at structure in genetic data. And what matters here is that you end up with major axes of variation, as you do in PCA. But you then have the power of discriminant analysis to separate groups. And what you see here is different colors. Each dot is a simulation. We obviously didn't tell the, the method. Uh, what was what, you can see it separates perfectly the ones that have specific memory from the ones that don't. So we can use this, and I'm going to uh, move on, but 
we use the data from Ghana, and that's this point over here. The empirical data is classified with systems that have this competition and these specific interactions and memory. So I didn't tell you that we use the classification. Essentially, what we did is to give uh, the, to give the, the method 30 properties of the network. We didn't even choose them. We just used network properties that were in a series of categories. So on the basis of the networks, the system can distinguish. And indeed, we can also look at networks through time, just this is time, the same, like the similarity, persistence, now is also shown in the interlayers. Just to say, that if you look at those networks, you can now look for modules, essentially pathogens that look more like, like uh, each other and more distinct from other groups, and look at the modules, when do they arise and when do they go extinct? Those would be like strains in our system. And I'm saying this because, after all, the uh, negative frequency dependence selection should, uh, we know that uh, it should enhance persistence. And here it is very interesting that you can see many modules. This is the full model with memory. And the modules have a certain lifetime. They, the neutral model has modules, but they are much less persistent. So what is happening through this intense competition is this long-term persistence of the strains that then are, are also changing over time. Just to say there are, uh, the point I'm trying to get across is that in this very large space of variation, the networks of trade similarity have signatures of this important process. And you can look at the networks either at a given time or over time and see these patterns of limiting similarity that do not look any more like simple clusters. They don't look like your nice uh, expectation of niches. They look more messy, but they look more messy because we are in an enormous space of variation. However, there are patterns of limiting similarity. Now, I like to get to this question that I think is even more interesting. This system has nothing to do with neutrality, right? But as I said, even if uh, things are more different than we expect at random, they are sufficiently different because there are so many pieces, so many genes, and so much variation at the lower level of organization. But why is there so much variation? I think that's an interesting question. And in fact, I hope to show you sort of three slides to convince you that it's completely, uh, completely necessary in a sense that the kind of uh, strong competition at one level is going to generate these many pieces at the lower level, that one comes with the other. And that, so the basic idea in this paper with Shishin, we, uh, she had this idea. The basic idea was to look at this threshold for the accumulation of innovation. The idea is the following. If a new gene comes into the picture and goes extinct before something new arises, we are not going to see much uh, accumulation of diversity. Instead, if uh, we generate new genes and they take a while uh, to go away, so they overlap, we are going to accumulate diversity. That's a very simple picture, but you can put it in a formula where we come up with a number a little bit akin to the R0 we all know, but this is for novelty. So we call, we call it R diversity, where you multiply the rate of generation of novelty by the average li lifetime of those established genes. So in your lifetime as a new gene, how many other new genes are generated? The idea is very simple. Now, if you take and write a formula for this rate of generation, there is an interesting quantity, which is not whether you are generated, that's mu, but what is the, the probability that something new 
you invade. Without going into the formula, I can tell you that this invasion probability increases with more intense competition. So the intense competition at one level will facilitate the, inv the invasion of new things. Now, this is cool. That threshold, in fact, happens. This is to show from many simulations. This is the log of that quantity. When it's one, what I'm measuring here is over 100 years in the simulation, of course, the percentage of new genes. There are different colors for seasonal, non-seasonal, different parameters. And over those 100 years, over these transients, if you are below this, of course, you don't accumulate any novelty. And there is this threshold you can take on and accumulate novelty. Interestingly, this axis, this quantity we just uh, described, is correlated with the intensity of transmission. So the higher the transmission rate, the higher the competition, the higher this number, the more you will accumulate diversity in the past. This takes time. So, and this is how it looks. Each color is a different gene coming in from a system we start at low diversity. Above the threshold, you are going to build a lot of diversity. Below the threshold, new things in color here, the gray things are at very low frequencies, they are all put together. New things come and go, they do not stick, they do not accumulate. So what I'm saying is that the weakening of interactions at one level can also weaken the diversity of the pieces or the variation we have to build the diversity. So here we have phenotyped multiple traits. These are the genes that encode the traits. And when we talk about hyperdiversity, basically one goes with the other. The problem is that this is a threshold, right? So we may cross it and lose the ability to maintain diversity at this higher level. This is not demographic extinction. This is an extinction that has purely to do, well, extinction, extinction of diversity. So let me bring it back to uh, something less computational, but more based on equations, and get back to the epidemiology, more to sort of the ecology, the ecological dynamics, and this question of thresholds in the epidemiology. This is the final part of the talk, I'll be brief. Uh, you may know Andre de Ross, uh, he, he is my collaborator here and the main person behind the analysis of this system. He, is first, he, he does a lot of very good work with structure, population models in ecology. In fact, uh, yeah, I think he, that's his kingdom. So I'm going to talk about this positive feedback between diversity at different levels of organization. And this is the view we can have a very resilient system that is endemic, has large strain on genetic diversity, and has uh, very difficult to, to intervene. And we can have also a system that is more epidemic with low strain on genetic diversity over here that may be easier to, uh, to essentially uh, uh, control. And what we are sort of looking at is this connection between transmission intensity. Importantly for us, that's the intensity of ecological interactions. And then this is diversity generation. So that there is a feedback between the rate of interactions that are allowing diversity and the generation of diversity at the lower level. So this is the picture you have large gene diversity in the pool, then you will have genomes that carry distinct genes. That, uh, that builds a lot of strain diversity that allows lower competition, higher transmission intensity, and therefore higher reproduction. And if you have growth, large growth, then you are producing more novelty. And this goes like this. So it's late. Excuse me for this next slide. I will not go over it, but I think I just want to make two points. First, now we, instead of doing simulations in a computer code, we have equations, 
I feel I feel attached to them. It took a while, but mostly, <laughs> mostly, I wanted to make two points here. T imagine trying to write an epidemiological model like what people have done for COVID. We have all now all the time those models, and you have two or three variants. Imagine doing this and keep track of what is going on here. It's impossible. So what we tried to do was to to write some sort of uh, the simple possible system that starts getting to that without tracking all the strengths. So what we then have is the we have susceptibles and infected. We don't have immune because no one is immune. And we have a structured population model because we follow the age of, of individuals. So we have the distribution of susceptibles as a function of age. Then we have the infected. And what is different here from the standard model is we introduce this variable P, which in addition to age, it counts the number of genes that you have seen before. So this is a, a model that is structured by the amount of memory you have of the diversity you have seen. So little p is the fraction of the trait or gene diversity you have already seen. And you can structure the population according to that. But importantly, we also have an equation for the total number of genes in the population. I only want to show you what happens in a system like this. In a system like this, you get the famous uh, idea of a tipping point and alternative steady states. So this is the contact rate, which I will call here the transmission intensity. And for each transmission intensity, we find the equilibrium that the system will reach in time. So you can see that for high transmission intensity, in this model, there are two equilibria, one at low prevalence, one at, at high prevalence. And then here, we only have the low equilibrium. This is essentially what we call alternative steady states and the conditions for a tipping point, because you are going to come, as we reduce transmission, you are going to jump to the lower level. So this is diversity also shows alternative steady states. It also shows a tipping point. And uh, what I want to show you here I'm just going to skip this comparison to data. We can do something in the mold you cannot do in the real world. We have a lower and a higher equilibrium. So we can ask what kind of perturbation will get us to the low equilibrium. Here we want to get to the low equilibrium. So what we did, take this panel here, is to consider whether you go to one equilibrium or the other as a function of the number of infections you, you, you cured and the number uh, and how much you decrease the diversity. So if you could do both, which of these would, would matter? Of course, you cannot do this in the real world. You can't remove diversity without removing <coughs> infections. But the point is, you have to remove of the order of 95% of the diversity to bring the system to the lower equilibrium. And it doesn't matter how many infections you have. What really matters is that you remove diversity. So this makes the point that this system is incredibly robust because of its diversity. And now I'm going to um, speculate a little bit, try to take it back to what this means. If we now forget that, OK, species are reproductively isolated, that wasn't true here, but we think about diversity a bit more broadly. Hyperdiverse systems that, that, uh, in which diversity is maintained by specific and frequency dependent interactions may well very much are occurring at the opposite end of neutrality, right? But in this enormous space. So essentially, they may be extremely difficult to differentiate from neutrality, but they depend very strongly on the specific uh, differences between individuals or, or species. I also showed you that 
there can be signatures such as network structure that would characterize limiting similarity in this very large space. It's just in most systems, we don't know which traits to look at. And if that is happening, then we, and we have something like the janssen connell hypothesis, like what I showed you now, this would set the stage for the existence of an unappreciated threshold that has to do with the ability of a system to basically accumulate diversity. And this naturally leads to the possibility of sharp transitions that would arise from this positive feedback between the intensity of the ecological interactions and the genetic diversity that underlies such interactions. And these transitions, I should say, are relevant for the persistence slash elimination of hyperdiverse systems in epidemiology and conservation. Sorry, I have them backwards. No, yes, backwards. So we are interested in persistence in conservation, elimination in epidemiology, but essentially we have the same issue. In one case, uh, I would say, I was saying in the case of malaria, this high diversity makes, makes it harder to eliminate. Uh, it would also uh, underlie the persistence of those systems. But once we get close to those thresholds and start losing the diversity of the genetic variation that underlies the specific interactions, then uh, we are getting into fragility uh, regardless of what happens with our animals. To close, there are many pathogens that play this game. Uh, you, if you're not interested in patterns, in, in those uh, patterns, uh, I remind you that uh, Johnson connell dynamics very much talks about this. And that if you look in the ecological literature, competition models with evolution uh, create these kinds of clusters. This is in a one-dimensional trait axis. I hope I have convinced you that uh, it wouldn't occur in one dimensional trait, in a one dimensional trait axis, that it is particularly interesting because it is going to occur in a very large space of variation. And so, to, to um, just thank my collaborators on the empirical front, uh, as I mentioned, Karen Day and her team who make possible uh, looking at data and not just fantasizing about the theory. Thank you very much. Much. I think we have plenty of time for, for questions. Well, maybe one from online or for one. I have one for myself. Yeah. <laughs> you are allowed. I had forgotten that malaria has sexual reproduction in the mosquito host. And so arguably all the sort of immune dynamics that are happening in humans, it, that's sort of decoupled from the evolutionary processes happening as a result of sexual reproduction. So this is a very theoretical question. I was wondering if those were swapped, if sexual reproduction were happening in humans and asexual reproduction in the mosquitoes, how might that change the ecological <laughs> therapy <laughs> well, of the evolutionary dynamics you're seeing? Yeah, that, that is a very tough question. <laughs> it's not a fair question, but... <laughs> I'm just no, kind of fascinated. No, no, I think, but I, I will perhaps answer, get out of the... the the question by saying that they are not truly that decoupled because what happens if you have very high transmission is that a host, a human host, will carry multiple uh, parasites. So there is this multiplicity of infection, which in fact is, is very interesting, which can go 5, 15, you can carry different parasites, right? So one of the reasons the, the, the vector is going to pick up parasites to, and recombine them is because the hosts are carrying uh, more than one. So, so I would say that those are very tightly coupled. But it is, a, it is an interesting question yeah, that it happens in the mosquito. And by the way, the conditions, the environmental conditions that favor the, the mosquito, its biting rates, etc., in a sense, set the stage for strong competition. Right, so 
So it is having a very good vector and very high transmission that essentially is, you know, set the stage for these kinds of things. And, and there is this combination of high transmission and high recombination that you cannot pull apart. Kind of as a connection to that, I was curious about the difference between influenza, say, and malaria. And is it then the transition, uh, the transmission rate that shifts the dynamics to this, you know, yeah, tipping is, point dynamic, so to speak? Yeah. yeah, it is a very interesting question, like in the, yeah, I would say several things, but both for flu or, or also uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, where you have, in fact, the, the puzzle was to explain the limiting standing diversity of influenza. Because if you look at the tree, the, the branches are short at, at any given time. There are not many coexisting traits. There, there is a dominant one, etc. So it's very interesting how you know why that and not something else. In fact, um, one of our arguments early on looking at flu was that in fact the dynamics of flu is, in that sense, mutation limited. So the rate of mutation, so the phenotypic mutation, so the effective mutation at which, at which you can get a new, a, new, uh, a new variant is too slow to, to generate this kind of divergence of, that gives you coexisting branches. So you don't need necessarily to have, uh, and of course you don't have the kind of you have you have some reassortment, but you don't have the, the so the reassortment of the viruses does not of these viruses does not provide a recombination rate that is as as high as what happens happens in malaria. So so I would say that that yes that the environmental conditions that favor high transmission also favor um, very fast diversification, but still still. Uh, I should point out that these vargins talking about persistence, uh, the, the vargins in humans can be uh, seen to be uh, genetically, you can find similar pieces in uh, malaria parasites of primates. So the point is, it's some of those pieces that are part of the genes are extremely uh, persistent and uh, in, in evolutionary time. And, and so when we think of a region that has had good, good conditions for transmission, regionally and over long evolutionary times, we have, you have built this enormous pool of variation. And that's where I was sort of connecting a little bit to the idea of persistence. So you have uh, persistence of the strains despite the combination, persistence of the genetic pieces, all that are, I mean, all these symptoms of balancing selection, but a different levels of organization. Yes. What a fascinating talk. I uh, really enjoyed it. I'm wondering, um, when you, does diversity, diversity often involves a lot of feedback. And what you were saying was the greater the diversity, the more difficult it is to get rid of something. Um, I'm wondering, um, how this might relate to tropical versus Arctic kinds of assemblages. Um, and when we're talking about survivorship in a changing climate, uh, whether or not um, up in the Arctic you've got a few species that are very highly specialized and very variable, whereas down the tropics you've got the very specific very, very specific, but also in very narrow niches. And as we get into climate change, we get more and more variation in the boundary conditions under which they can survive. Um, how does what you're showing us relate to those kind of problems? Yeah, that, that is a very interesting question and one uh, a bit in my mind in terms of uh, asking other people that work with other systems more charismatic than this one, um, essentially biogeographically, right? Where, when we think of hotspots of diversity, let's say species diversity, what can we say about the pool of variation of the traits that matter for that? I must say, I haven't yet, uh, you know, found uh, a good system for that. 
I would expect, I would expect that the places that biogeographically promote a lot of interactions, and therefore the building, this evolutionary building of the niches, are going to have something like this, but something extremely complex that relies on having a lot of the a lot of variation, very and very specific uh, variation. And if you think about it, I made the point: intervening, intervening or preserving this is very different than if you had something uh, under neutrality where things are coming and going, right? Especially because of the time it took to have that interplay of ecology and evolution. And so, it's a it's a fascinating question: What would it take also to lose that? Like, for example, do if we in the tropics were to lose uh, the habitat, so you reduce the amount of land that you have for these interactions, then what does it do to, if we reduce interactions, it's almost paradoxical, but we reduce the interactions, we are going to make the system more fragile, right, even. And so I would imagine you have to look at places where the hotspots are determined by environmental suitability, right? And, but suitability for interactions. And so I haven't yet thought a little bit of this in a latitudinal gradient. I, I, I think it's a, it's a fascinating question. And, and we hear a lot, I think it was a fascinating, well, very important idea when we get to questions about the, the, uh, the value, um, not, the economic, not the ecosystem services, but some of the questions on uh, pre preserving or, or preser preserving nature that are more based on ideas from the humanities than ideas from economics, right? Essentially, what we are destroying is not, we, we already heard that it's not just species, it's interactions. It's more than the interactions. It's this enormous variation that enables the interaction. So I think like, when we put it in that perspective and the time it may have taken to create that regional pool of variation, hundreds of years, once it's gone, it's gone. I mean, and it can be gone in this very drastic uh, dynamics. So I think that gives you um, a sense of value that doesn't have to do with economic value, a sense of value that has to do with the complexity of these systems and a complexity that has nothing to do, as I said, with things just coming and going. Yes. A, a switch from that question also, when thinking more about variation, not just in the competition, but the environment of the host and how the host could be losing the recognition processes or everything, that, how that probably associates across geography too in all of these systems. And I don't know much about bird malaria, but I know it probably follows a lot of similar systems here where there's a lot more fragmentation. Yeah, in bird, that's a very interesting. I, I, I should talk more to, to some of the people looking at bird malaria because that is a system where, where you also uh, can have lots of diversity. But even if you look at the biogeograph, biogeography of malaria of humans, uh, the places, I, I was perhaps not specific enough, the places where this kind of thing is going on are the very high transmission regions that are very, very good for transmission, where basically the number of infected bites uh, per year, which is a measure of transmission intensity, can be 100, can be sometimes more than 100, right? So, so those are, are, are places, for example, in West Africa. But if... Um, you go to New Guinea or even to South America where you have low diversity, then you have uh, more clonal malaria in a sense with the more, more of the population genetics that we are used to think about with uh, less diversity and more epidemic, more epidemic disease. And indeed, uh, of course, tomorrow I get another chance to talk so I can talk <laughs> about climate and disease. The places where we are successful at intervening are, are these places uh, that have low transmission levels that are more epidemic and have less diversity. Yes. OK, I'm going to try a completely wacky question here and see how it goes. I love that you started with the uh, complex adaptive systems 
as a way to kind of frame some of these questions. Uh, a lot of the uh, systems that we operate in are social ecological systems, mm -hmm. share some of these same properties, diversity, modularity, which bring about resilience in various ways. I just wondered if you've thought about your findings in the context of the application to social ecological systems. Yeah, I interesting that you mentioned uh, this. I um, not so much in social, social ecological because I have to think uh, very hard there. But but I I was talking to to a complex system uh, uh, postdoc who is working with innovation in just social systems and uh, technical systems and so on and uh, has lots of data sets on that. Um, I thought, it, yeah, we are interested in discussing, can we find uh, similar, essentially, issues about, uh, about diversity and so on. In social ecological, you know, I've thought mostly about the, just the, these tipping points and, and intervention, but not so much about uh, innovation per se. But, but I think, yes, this should apply. To, to other systems in which innovation is an important part of the interactions. Well, with that, I see that the food just came in uh, and <laughs> it's, it's getting dark. So I just say thanks so much for it. such a fascinating. Well done. Well, yeah, so I think our tech guy. You know, I am also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's fun to do the. Oh, is it? Oh, it was way to find this yeah, so I was like, you the, I was like, oh, I can't give you all the Yeah, I stuck around. Same, same thing. My partner's here to work in. Um, oh, yeah. Right? Okay. So, uh, wait, you see the I That's what I was thinking about with uh, the of the I think it was a of a of of a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a